in 104.7 FM. Also, you can listen on the TuneIn app on WJOB, or even right now you can catch on my uh, Facebook page, facebook.com slash jim.dedlo, and then you'll get a D-E-D-E-L-O-W. Professor Rupp, or Dr. Rupp, is most engaging and a lot of fun to interview. That's what my notes say. Is that true, <laughs> Dr. Rupp? We had a good time last time I was here. I think we had your friend Lisa Goodnight on. So Lisa, Lisa yeah, Lisa and I team teach, and we uh, have fun on the uh, on the radio waves. Richard Rupp is an associate professor of political science at Purdue Northwest. We're going to talk a little bit about Purdue Northwest and about Professor Rupp, and then we're going to go straight into the national elections and some of the implications that they might be having for us here in the Midwest and uh, some of the stuff that's going on. Professor Rupp Rupp obviously uh, studies this and uh, teaches it, but also a pretty good observer on what's happening on a day-to-day basis. Professor Rupp, where'd you grow up? I grew up in the Bay Area near San Francisco. And where was that exactly? Uh, Belmont, actually, is a city I grew up in. Mom yeah. and Dad still have the house they bought in 1960 for $15,500. Now yeah. it's worth one point five. So. And so it's in the South Bay or in the West Bay? In the, or in the on the East? South Bay. In the San, South San Mateo, Bay. Burlingame area. So it's in the Silicon Valley right. general vicinity, and Silicon Valley uh, has uh, almost impossible rents. Well, Insane. the rents actually are a lot better than actually purchasing the uh, properties. Yeah, my they're... my dad and mom bought that when he was a high school teacher, and literally for fifteen five. And he's still complaining about that. He thinks my uncle uh, didn't give him enough money to help him out. In any event, the house is currently worth, and it's a small, you know, two bedroom place, one point five million. And the po- the point, the reason why I'm mentioning it is, there's no way a high school teacher now could move into the Bay Area and start a life like my parents did all those years ago. So it's quite a commentary. And uh, that is exactly what's going to happen here right along Indianapolis Boulevard. It's going to just shoot up some of this property values as Mont Hanley and myself and Chancellor Keon and some other uh, leaders of the uh, entrepreneurship and the commercialization community here are going to create that Silicon Valley type feeling right here along Indianapolis Boulevard. I know that... A lot of people laugh at me and so forth, but we're already getting some decent momentum. One Million Cups is this fr- uh, this Wednesday at 9 a.m., and anyone who wants to be part of the entrepreneurship community around here, you all got to do is come on over, get here about quarter to nine, and talk with others in the, that are trying to promote entrepreneurship here in Northwest Indiana, and it's right here at the Purdue Northwest Commercialization Center on Indianapolis Boulevard. How long have you been with Purdue, Cal, then Purdue Northwest? About 20 years. Uh, and so I've been coming down this street for 20 years, and I'm very excited about what you and the Chancellor are working on because I, you know this, this street, amazingly, hasn't changed hardly a bit in the 20 years I've been here. So if you guys can get your act together and turn this place into something that's happening, I, I think it'd be marvelous for the city, it'd be great for the university. It's just all good. You know, even like right now in the elections that we're going to talk about, you know, there's talk about business and banks and industry and heavy manufacturing, but the truth of the matter is is that most people work in small businesses right. and more and more the uh, uh, proportion of people working are working in startup businesses. Sure. And so that's kind of what we're looking forward is to make a fertile ground for those seeds to grow. And it takes time, it takes money, it takes... Uh, the chancellor's vision, yeah, and then you have to have uh, just kind of get lucky. Well, and you know, to me, to my thinking, you know, we're both looking down Indianapolis right now, and I've got to think property value is pretty pretty affordable here. So when you're thinking about a startup, you're not talking about you know a huge amount of investment to build uh, local businesses here. So always, t- to me, it's so odd that we live so close to the university, and there's not even a Panera's. There's not even you know dec- decent uh, food establishments in the area. So I think that's what we've really got to push, amongst other things. Well, you know, part of it is, you know, it is affordable, but the, the, uh, well, you, you, I went to the venture capital week long, got right. a certificate in California, and I've gone to a number of other symposiums and stuff, and they talk about what's called an innovation cluster. And so you have to have the other things that support innovation you can't just have a university right. you have to have a core of lawyers you got to have the accounts you got to have the uh people that know how to do patents you got to have right. the money the people that know how to value your companies and and invest in them that's a big mm-hmm. one 
you know, there's like four or five major components of it, of which we really just have the university. Right. Now we're starting to get the entrepreneurship community where you can come in and talk to us and we can show you where the resources are and so forth. But it just takes a lot of Part of it, though, as you well know, you come from the Bay Area, there's a little bit more open-mindedness to innovation and new things. You're just dealing with a mentality here. Right. I mean, I've had very, I've had a lot of people laugh right in my face, which is is good because it just makes you that much yeah. more resilient. But there's not a lot of acceptance of doing things a new way around here. It was the most striking thing in my uh, experience when I came here that just the mindset of say a Northwest Indiana mindset versus you know what I found in the Bay Area. It was just night and day, uh, as far as kind of a, fa a certain fatalism about the future. And so for 20 years, my my goal has been to you know try to address that in classes and, you know, get my kids out, not only to Chicago, but I'm very involved in our study abroad programs. And the university has changed significantly in the 20 years I've been here. And they've been just, we've been really globalizing the university. It's cool to see. Well, if, if you really look at that, I agree with you being on the university a lot, having a lot of students, you're looking at right, right here, you're looking at Purdue guys looking at you uh, as we're sitting here doing the show. And the, uh, the mentality on the university here in IUN too. Right. I mean, there's a lot of advancement and things that can happen. The problem is, is that as soon as they come out and they look around and say, well, you know, that's really not shared in the general community. They go somewhere else and take their talents. Right. That's a big problem. But I'll tell you what, really what it takes around here, uh, Richard Rupp, is my mind is one major success, mm -hmm. one major innovation tech type company that's built along Indianapolis Boulevard here. And then you really will get that momentum. We'll find that. We'll find and it'll it. take some time. Let's go right now. Tomorrow is the announcement, I mean, is the election for President of the United States. Let's start right there at the top of the ticket. I've got the ballot up here. I felt bad for Harold Hall. He couldn't find the ballot printed mm -hmm. out anywhere. I heard about that. Yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, you know, I can get it in, you know, I got it in about 10 or 15 seconds here on the Internet, but he's not Internet savvy. But right here it says, U.S. President and Vice President Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine, and U.S. President and Vice President Donald J. Trump and Mike Pence. Let me just throw it out there. I mean, when I say presidential election 2016, and you look back on it in a year, what do you think the reflection is going to be like? Well, let me answer it this way. So I'm a political scientist and a social scientist, and I, I actually take the job seriously. It's my job to be objective and to grapple with evidence and data and not persuade people, including your viewers of my personal views. I have to tell you in the last year that's been an extraordinarily difficult task given the election that we've had. Um, and I think I'll have thoughts a year from now, but my thoughts right now, and because I've spoken to many groups, high school groups over, over the last year, my college students, I've been overseas talking to groups, and it's been difficult to maintain my objectivity because actually I think what I'm about to say is totally objective. I think Donald Trump is an authoritarian and he's been fueling racism and xenophobia and misogyny. And I think this is one of the most traumatizing elections. It is the most traumatizing election that I've ever witnessed. And it has rep uh, ramifications that will go far beyond tomorrow. I think we're all gonna take a collective sigh of relief tomorrow night. But the trauma uh, has been deep and wide, and it will continue. You were just chatting with your last uh, last gentleman in, in, in the radio spot here. Billy Buzzkill. Billy Buzzkill. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, Billy Buzzkill was uh, pretty apocalyptic about the situation, about where we're going to be heading. I'm not quite as apocalyptic, but I would say that when you've had a trauma like this, uh, it will have lasting repercussions. You know, that's weird that you bring it up like that, a trauma. As a uh, former, I, I went to school to like be a counselor, and I worked for that for a little while. And trauma in a psychological setting and a counseling session, setting is like usually why someone's there. Right. You know what I mean? They're, right. they're, they're, it's why they're in the halfway house or they're why they're coming to you for counseling and so forth. And to unwork that trauma, it was just like, I'm done. I can't. I, people have trauma, and they never get over it, and I don't feel like I'm doing any good. I hope that your your analysis of this is at least slightly inaccurate in that the uh, trauma is not as deep as it could be to, you know, kind of dent our psych, psyche going forward. Because if indeed the Trump phenomena and the arguing and all the stuff we've been enduring for a year, year and a half could be kind of injurious to, to our, like, 
hope for the future. I agree with that, though, and I, I think that's that's the problem. I think this this election process has been utterly injurious. I think what's different, though, there's different things about this election because you know every election is bad. You know, whenever even even Mitt Romney and, and Obama, you know, it's, we're, we're happy it's done. But this has been a unique election. You've you've had a delegitimization almost of democratic institutions in this in this election. Trump's this morning talking about how rigged this election is going to be, and huge numbers of Americans believe that. And one of the things that we can tell you from the good political science literature is this country does not have rigged elections. And it's an empirical statement of fact that our elections are not riddled with fraud. However, he's put that out there day after day after day, and millions, tens of millions of millions of people believe that, which delegitimizes the entire institutional process of, of elections. But it's not just that. Uh, it's this idea of saying he will not necessarily accept the election results. That's also never happened. He's, they're, they're talking about getting ready to impeach Mrs. Clinton, Mrs. Clinton uh, already before the election results are in. Uh, no action on the Supreme Court nominee. And they're talking about actually uh, in, a in a Clinton presidency that the Republicans will not act on that. When I see references to Second Amendment solutions and when I hear him say the Secret Service should put down their arms, this is, is an entirely different conversation than that we've ever had. And so that's why I think it's so hugely traumatizing. And one of the things Billy was talking about, which is so mortifying from my perspective, is he's right. We've had absolutely no conversation about public policy this year. And that's not all Mr. Trump. That's also Mrs. Clinton. There's been, we have so many very serious public policy issues to address. And yet we've had this cake fight, which is putting it nicely, for the past year. You know, let me follow up. By the way, Dr. Richard Rupp from Purdue Northwest is here. If you guys want to call, call in, get your uh, comments in. Who do we have at 830, Ryan? Uh, Dr. Telex up next. So you got about 15 minutes to get him in and, and get your convert. But you've said a couple things in here. This country does not have rigged elections. Uh, upwards of half of people in America don't agree with that. They're wrong. Okay, explain why. Because we have a great deal of data that has, has systematically looked at how elections are, are run in this country, and we the examples of specific voter fraud, we're, we're finding a, in well, well below 1%, well, well below 1%. And so one of the reasons why our elections are not rigged and are not fraudulent uh, is because of the open nature of the process, because of the transparency of the process. The biggest problem actually with our elections is that we do have the problem of the structure being flawed, and, but that's different than, than conspiracy to seize an election. So we still have millions of people, uh, dead people on voter lists. That's, that's always been there. That's always been a problem. But they're not actually turning out the vote. It's not like one of the parties is, okay, there's three million people in the state of Illinois who are on voter lists, so we'll just get them all to vote. That's not happening, and we would know if that's happening. So, so let's turn it around and look at it from a you know a specific like voter fraud thing, but back to the media involved with the elections. Right. Now, one of the major constructs of their uh, campaign for Donald Trump, and I had Eric Trump on uh, two weeks ago, same thing, is a consistent battering of how the media shapes public opinion to go for the Democrat. Well, that's always been a, uh, a view of some, of, in some quarters uh, that there's a liberal bias. Um, it depends where you are. Yeah, right? but you this, see this, this, this is a very conservative country with very substantial media, uh, conservative media outlets. And so to say that there's, a, there's, a, there's an overall conservative uh, uh, bias or not for conservatives, given the scale of ownership of, of radio shows, of television, of print media, uh, there's a pretty balanced uh, conversation going on in this country. The problem is it's not a very sophisticated uh, conversation. 
most media coverage, especially in this election, has just been entertainment. Uh, this has been huge uh, financial uh, benefits for, uh, especially private media outlets, and so this this place included. So, so they're so they're making a fortune, uh, and consequently, and Donald Trump is made for this. You know, he he totally understands. He brilliantly understands how to play the American market, and so. But the sad thing is, even sophisticated media has has gone along with this. So if you watch the the Sunday morning news shows, which in the old days used to have pretty serious people like. John Chancellor and David Brinkley reporting. Now it's a clown show, uh, and they will bring on a, an Ann Coulter uh, to talk about the nation's uh, public policy issues. So the media has done a, a, a pr is has done a pretty grim job in this. So so our major our major institutions in the country are letting us down. Our political institutions are are letting us down. Our media institutions are letting us down, and it's distressing. Political institutions leading, letting us down and media institutions letting us down. Let's catch to that in a second. I want to get back to why so many people are attracted to Donald Trump's phenomenon. Tough question, because and we, and we have spent a lot of this year, and that, that's something we'll be analyzing for years, is what, what explains the Trump phenomena? Why, why, why did he capture the Republican nomination, a man who has so little commitment to the Republican Party and who so d demonstrably is not a conservative? So, so what has attracted them? From my, from my perspective, there are, there are three factors that account for, for Trump's rise uh, and are responsible for Trump's rise. One is the Republican Party is the the crisis within the Republican Party clearly made Trump uh, possible because the establishment within the party has been so fractured that it was unable to to control the election process. Second are the tens of millions of Americans who frankly have authoritarian views and there are tens of millions of Americans who share Trump's racism and xenophobia and homophobia. And so when Hillary Clinton made that gaffe about uh, talking about uh, the bundles of deplorables, you know, I don't know where the hell she got that phrase, but there's a lot of truth in it. That's not all Trump supporters. Uh, I have family members, Uncle Phil, who was supporting Trump, very painful for me. Uh, so you've got a lot of serious people who are supporting Trump, but you do have tens of millions of Americans who he knows how to play. And then the, and the third factor in explaining Trump is just Trump. He's P.T. Barnum. He's an extraordinarily talented man uh, with a limited worldview and a limited aim within that worldview. And all these three factors have come to, together to create this, this uh, election cycle. Let's go back to number two here. Tens of millions have authoritarian views. They share racism, xenophobia, homophobia. Is it good or bad that that's being shown? Being shown. Well, um, it's bringing it's being shown in a light. So I see your point. It's, it's not necessarily that we don't want to know it's out there. So now, so now we know it's out there, and we've always known it's out there. But now it's been given a voice, and so that's part of the frightening component of this. In, in years past, this authority, you know, th these are not people. The, the Trump supporters are not people who have been waiting in the wings for a Donald Trump. They have been, in effect, quiet. They're, these are these are people who are not terribly political, but they're this, a little bit like a little bit like the Bernie supporters. These are angry people who have felt that government has let them down, and they want a voice. So this, so the Bernie people are obviously different politically, but the the Trump people that's a big part of of who they are. So they're not. We're not talking about there are tens of millions of Americans seeking to take to the streets and and topple the government. It's just that. They do have views that are you can quantify if you if we have definitions of what homophobia is, what is racism, uh, and they have these views, and now they have a, an individual who they are uh, uh, tantalized by, who is giving voice to their views and is speaking to them on their rather guttural level. We're talking to Richard Rupp, Doctor Richard Rupp. He is the associate professor of political science at. Purdue Northwest, we've got some uh, texts that are coming in. Nice to hear someone intelligent speaking instead of the steady stream of insane comments. And uh, documented vote fraud being committed so far all by Trump voters, not by Clinton voters. And uh, if you guys want to call in and talk to uh, Dr. Rupp, you can do that right now at 219-845-1100. Let's look at the other side. So we looked at the Trump sure. phenomenon. You've got a woman 
president that should be part or possible president here that should be part of the discussion it's almost lost behind all of the fog that's out there right now and one of the fogs that is out there is the fact that the clintons were in office and came out made a ton of money kind of selling their services to the richest of the rich right and now they're back trying to tell everybody that they're the democratic party for the average american it's a little bit disjointed you got a number of trust issues from the emails to the clinton foundation i mean you can go on and on but it doesn't seem to matter. She still got 47% of the vote, which is what Mitt Romney predicted from the beginning. Right. And she's probably going to win as the least trusted president ever elected in America. What does that say about what's going on? No, oh, it's a stag- staggering commentary, I think. Uh, and, I th- and I believe it's fair to say that if the Republicans had gotten their act together and nominated Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio or John Kasich, she would be losing by at least four or six points right now. And so that's a staggering uh, commentary, I think, that that she's going to enter the White House simply because the Republicans made this cataclysmic mistake of nominating Donald Trump. And so why would she have lost more than likely to an establishment Republican? Trust issues are are central to it. Um, And, you know, you begin talking about uh, when you turned over to Mrs. Clinton, you talked about the money issues. I, you know, they released their taxes this year uh, as opposed to Trump. And they released their uh, their income of 12 million dollars last year. And they were very forward with that. And you said, we want to be transparent and forward. Well, the way I talked about with my students was. What on earth was she doing making $12 million next year? It's just bad politics, not to mention uh, any other issues we could put on the table. She's going to be running for the presidency, and she is go- and she is going to major Wall Street firms, and she's not taking 10000 or 50000 but she's taking hundreds of thousands. I have some pretty wealthy friends, and even my wealthy friends think you know, $100,000 is a big deal. Uh, and so consequently, I think th- the... Uh, idea of of how Mrs. Clinton carries herself, be it the 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 circle the wagons that we saw, even on the pneumonia period, that there's a circle the wagons that the Clintons in effect are constantly under unfair attack. When I when I look at where they are being attacked for their transparency and their trust issues, and when I and when I talk to a lot of my uh, friends and colleagues at the university, uh, who are middle aged women, and they won't vote for Trump, but they have an even more visceral reaction of negativity to Mrs. Clinton. I think that's quite a commentary. Let's see what MX says. MX, what's up? Well, hi there. Uh, I'm a 41-year uh, Democratic Union guy who's uh, turning to vote Republican. I'm not voting for Trump, and I'm not voting for Hillary. I'm voting for the Republican Party, which means a lot to me right now. I think one of the biggest things uh, we got going is uh, we've got 46 million people on welfare for the last three years. Right now in Lake County, Indiana, our unemployment rate went up. Our jobs have been shipped overseas. Obamacare, which I am for, is a total disaster. If Too bad this didn't get out in the summer. If you look at everybody's rates, they're supposed. The, the bottom line is the rates are supposed to go up 25%. Actually, some people that post in MX cartoons, they have doubled. Some people are paying $1,700 a month for two people. Uh, You know what? Benghazi. How can you go in there and and press the Hillary button or the Democratic button when you left four soldiers up on a roof? You know... All right, hold on a second, MX. You put a lot in there. We're going to hit it right now. Hold on. Thank you. You got got there. Does he represent... What's he represent right there? He represents uh, a, a, a concerned citizen, and his mind is uh, a spinning uh, with so many issues, and he's trying to make sense of the world, and it's very difficult to make sense of the world when you have uh, two political parties and the candidates of those political parties talking out, out of every corner uh, and, and not even approximating a, 
a, a rather coherent, straight approach, and that they've spent so much time talking about what they're against as opposed to what they're for. So he's a little he's a little lost, and and under, understandably, let me just say this quickly because he began by saying he was a Democrat and he's going to be voting Republican. I could I could imagine some of your reviewers saying, "Oh, this Rupp, he's just one of those liberal professors from Purdue." And and you know, I I began life actually. I think I'm wearing my Reagan cufflinks. When I was a kid, 30 years ago, I I worked for Reagan Bush in California where I grew up. And so my early years were with the Republican Party. And actually, I think the Republican Party not only is great, but it's absolutely vital to our democracy because we only have two political parties. And when you only have two political parties, it's essential that they both basically be committed to broadly based liberal democratic values. I don't mean liberal, progressive liberalism. I'm, I mean the basic foundations of a liberal democracy. And I would tell you that the current Republican Party is in such a crisis and civil war that affects the stability of our system. All right, last phone call. Bill, you're on the air. Go ahead. Uh, well, it's easy to be cynical when Hillary's maid is handling top-secret documents, Hillary's husband fixes her criminal case, and Hillary's daughter's wedding is paid by the Clinton Foundation. My God, there's no right and wrong anymore. All right, let's take that last comment. There's no right and wrong anymore in politics there was never right and wrong in politics politics is about the art of compromise and that's one of the things that has been lost in the last particularly in the last 10 years is that historically the reason why you this country functions as as well as it does is it requires two political parties and right now we only have two to to debate rigorously and to spin rigorously but at the end of the day elections are over and Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill get together over drinks in the White House living quarters and cut a deal on Social Security. That's how politics works in a democracy. That's how we keep blood off the streets. There needs to be compromise. We now have a situation in which I have to, I'm sorry I'm focusing so much on the Republicans, but I think they are the key dependent variable. They are so not committed to the art of politics that we have not been able to go forward in compromise legislation really quickly. One of the issues with Obamacare that's so problematic is that after the adoption of Obamacare, it has basically not been amended because th there's been no willing to, willingness to amend. If you look at the years after Social Security was adopted, if you look at 33, 34, 35, you'll see that Congress spent an enormous amount of time fine-tuning Social Security because it was such a massive piece of legislation. They couldn't get it right on the first day. So they rolled out the first day in 33, I think it was as adopted, but it takes years to, to do that. The same thing with Medicare and Medicaid. But because we shut down compromise as soon as it was adopted, it can't be fine-tuned, and so of course there will be failings within the system. We're going to have Dr. Rupp on again. He's, he's got it going. Thank you so much, Dr. Rupp. My I have pleasure. thoroughly enjoyed this. I will agree with the many texters that are coming on. Have this guy again. There it is. Uh, how can the elect all sorts of texts coming in, and uh, very much appreciate you coming in. This has been a show paid for by Purdue Northwest. Of course, uh, the uh, uh, winter term will be starting right after the... Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Thanks, Jim. Dr.